tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is artist, writer, director John Boscovich and writer producer Dale Lawner. John Boscovich is a fine artist who has had exhibitions in New York and Los Angeles. He's a conceptual artist who has a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy from USC. He studied English literature at Trinity College in Cambridge, England. He, uh, as a history, uh, actually he took art history at the Prado in, in Spain. He has a Bachelor of Fine Arts and a Master of Fine Arts from California Institute of the Arts, which is known as CalArts. And listen to this, a Juris Doctor from Loyola Law School. I mean, <laughs> come on, John, what's all this education? I don't know, I liked school. I guess you did. It avoided working, it helped me avoid working. <laughs> did you ever take the bar? No, I didn't. I knew by the end of law school that I, I didn't want to uh, proceed in law. I mean, but how? But I needed you... a. Fin I wanted it as a credential. Simply, you, a lot of credential. I mean, English literature and art to history and what else? Um, philosophy. Philosophy. <laughs> how did that help you as a conceptual artist? Well, I think that it it as the the law. All of it. <laughs> um, well, the law definitely helped me take like a more interrogatory approach to art making or filmmaking, did it? rather than a preachy didactic approach. Oh, it did. You so know, you, you kind did. of you kind of act as like an advocate. Mm -hmm. So you it, argue both sides. And and in your type of uh, work, mm -hmm. which is conceptual art, mm -hmm. that is simply interrogatory. So you have to you have to tell the viewers what conceptual art is. What well, that, you think that, about. that could be a mini-series. Well, let's I mean, <laughs> make it to five minutes. <laughs> <That's like that. laughs> Three minutes. <laughs> uh, that, that, you know, that's like, um, what are the causes of the Civil War, really? But, um, but what do people think of when they think I of I think conceptual. conceptual art really is just simply not having any allegiance to any media, per mm -hmm. se. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's just simply more about the idea than about making something. So it does really go back to your background. I mean, yes. there is a philosophical approach, and there yes. is, a, as you say, that law, that legal kind of questioning. Exactly. Thing. I see. So when you do a show, you don't just stand up and, or if you have an exhibition like you've had at Rosamund Felsen's or in New York, you don't just stand up and say, I was thinking about, um, what? Some didactics today. What do you do to put a show, <laughs> to put a show together? Well, I mean, it just it depends. Like my last show I did, I just had a series of ridiculous Polaroids sitting on my table, and I figured, oh, I, you know, one, a few friends came over, Meg Cranston and Chris Wilder, two um, LA artists that I really respect, and um, they said, yeah, you have enough work for a show. Why don't you put one together? And I kind of formulated it ad hoc. And I think uh, were sometimes these I don't even know when I'm making art that I'm making art. And is that what happened with the Polaroids? Yeah, It exactly. took an artist to tell you that this was art? Yeah, yeah. Is that what happened? Really, it, it was. You it have... It was Chris Wilder, actually. Was <laughs> you have... Uh, these pieces on the set, I think, were in yeah. the show. Yeah. So the one in the middle is time. <laughs> 102 a.m., 103 a.m. It's just changing channels. It was taken off of the TV. And, and this is what was on in the morning? Yeah. What do we see? It's um, Wally George. I think it's Yoda. In the middle. Um, I went back to Wally George. But it was. Ju were you in bed when you did it? No, I had to get out of bed actually to take the photograph. <laughs> but maybe originally I was. <laughs> <laughs> what about this first one? I. Uh, I just you talked about on. affirmations. Yeah, well, it's, it, the show was like kind of like a little subtle critique of the recovery movement, which I think has kind of gone too far. Oh, I see. On some aspects, and the, the, and the recovery is in it, every field. Yeah, of recovery everyone's recovering from, from everything. everything. 
right. and making a lot of money at it. From food to drugs to drink. Whatever. Everything. They're recovering. Okay. <laughs> and were you recovering or it, were you recovering? No, not at all. I, don't, I never want to recover. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I think that, um, I don't know, like some forms of the recovery movement definitely, I think, lower in our intellectual standards. I mean, these affirmations are ridiculous, I think. This one, is this an affirmation yeah, from it's very, it's all, They're all from one book. I illustrated one book, essentially. Oh, that's good. Oh, I see. So do the one in front. Oh, it says, I am renewed and refreshed by my actions. And it's kind of a multiple exposure of uh, Shiva, a little statue I had in my house. I just put it, I used no technical means when I took these photographs. They're all Polaroid spectra. And did you have a lot of Shivas or did you take? No, I just had one. And how did you a, make it? <laughs> it was a multiple, it actually was a, le it was a filter. Was it? And you got filter, all those? Yeah. <laughs> That was good. Uh -huh. That was good. And this one up. That was top. just a honey bird that I took out of my cupboard and placed on the countertop and took the photo. Made a little yellow gel, and mm -hmm. that was it. And what does it say? I appreciate my uniqueness. And that was your little honey bear. <laughs> and then did you have the honey after that? <laughs> no, I didn't actually. I, I put it in a, a plexiglass vitrine. So in a way, it was like kind of goo the Polaroids kind of goof a little bit on conceptual photography right now, which is like, I think, dominated by this kind of German photography, which is very big mm -hmm. and um, very dry. And usually the exteriors of bu buildings, it's like the progeny of Burton Hillebecker. So you went the other way? I went the other way. I, oh, I bought I American, in other words, I Polaroid see. American Corporation, very tiny, very yeah. personal non-professional, per se. Uh -huh. And in those other uh, works of conceptualism, I think people think that they're totally void of any feelings or totally void of Well, anything. feelings are bad in conceptual art, as we know it. Is it true? Uh, yeah, definitely. Well, but, but don't you think you have to have feelings in anything well, you do? Well, I do, but a lot of conceptual artists don't, don't feel that way. But you have feelings in your work just from the point of saying, uh, of putting the object with whatever you're working with. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so tell me a little bit more about this. How you can be a conceptual artist without the feeling. Well, I mean, I mean, I can only speak for myself. I can't. I mean, I always infuse emotional content in my work if I can. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it just seems that like the fashion is I to see. be as dry as possible. And that's not you, because not me you're all. a writer, and the, all of the things you've written are totally filled with emotion. Yeah, but I think you can still have intellectual content, and it can be very well thought out, too. Well, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that, because yeah. I think a person with all your education and all of your knowledge has got to have some kind of content <laughs> to it. <laughs> well, so, not necessarily. <laughs> well, no, I think so. When did you um, actually start writing? Well, I, I started off as a poet, actually, at a Venice Poetry Workshop in like about 1977, in 78, and it was pretty interesting at that time, like people like um, Exine and John Doe were in my workshop, and Amy Gersler, and people who subsequently have done a lot of interesting work. But they've gone away from they've poetry. They've gone away, yeah, they've kind of gone away from poetry. As you have. Yeah. You did, uh, was that the time when you hooked up with uh, San Sandra Bernard? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Out of the poet, uh -huh. kind of. As out much of the as poet. I can recall about my collaboration with Sandra, I think it was. How did that happen? How did it? Come I think about? we met at a barbecue. <laughs> Is that true? Uh, actually, it actually was a valley barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> you were born in Burbank. Yeah. Is that right, Canada? A, val a valley boy. That's a valley boy. So you didn't I go won't say dude. <laughs> We've been marginalized enough. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say, dude. <laughs> but you did, I think, the, the, the uh, first really recognizable piece of work that she did, Sandra. Which, you which wrote is uh, without, without you. Yes, definitely. We co-wrote it. What was it called? Without You I'm Nothing. And it started, tell us a little bit about well, it, it how it started, how you got with her. And well, it was funny. It was like, uh, I went to go see her at the comedy store, and I was actually playing piano for her at the time. You play the piano, too? Well, it was just like not very well. Oh, I can't believe you! <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> so um, a lot of the her references were going over people's heads, and I said, you know, she was a li little, you know, she didn't understand it. I said, you know, listen, you're not playing to your audience. You should play to like rock and roll clubs. 
you're kind of unwittingly doing performance art, but she wasn't that aware of it at the time. And so what I tried to do with her was to pick songs. She did a lot of music in her act, and I tried to pick songs that had like, that weren't so much about the singing of the song, like technically, uh -huh. but just about maybe the irony of singing that particular song, like Me and Mrs. Jones. Perfect. Which yeah. is kind of her signature song. Right. So then you wrote this piece, and it started out on stage without you, I'm yes, Nothing. Yes, and I directed it, too. And then it went... It, it, it uh, became an album, which got a Grammy nomination, which Sandra and I produced. Which is great. And, and then, then it um, became a film, which is now kind of, at this point, a cult film, I guess, because it just played The Village for, I think, three months. And we're going to see a clip from that. Yes. Okay. Yes. What clip is it? It's uh, one about the Andy Warhol estate auction. Oh, great. Okay. I around 79th in New York. And I walked past this one building and I ran into all these people I knew. I saw Bianca and Calvin and Kelly Klein. I said, hey, you guys, what's going on? They said, oh, it's the big Warhol estate auction today at Sotheby's, you know, Andy's auction. I said, oh my God, I forgot all about it. So I went in with them and it was amazing. It was like this incredible collage of Americana throughout the eras. I mean, there was Joan Quinn bidding on Fiesta wear. And there were those marvelous, great, cookie jars with black mammies. I mean, this kitsch wasn't shit. This was good quality kitsch, the kind of kitsch you want in your house. And there was the Jean-Michel Basquiat paintings, which I could kick myself for not buying. But who knew he was going to die except somebody like Andy, and Andy died first. And my God, those paintings are worth a fortune now. I mean, there was just everything, every facet of American culture, the arts and crafts movement, WPA, Art Deco, on and on and on. A wonderful array of everything. And I went into one room and there was amazing stacks and stacks and stacks of Navajo blankets, rugs, baskets and weavings. And I thought to myself, leave it to Andy to have the insight and sensitivity into the hours and hours of toil and labor that went into the Indian product that they've been so lucky to cash in on this whole Santa Fe thing happening. And you really understood the concept of potlatch. And I started bidding on this one marvelous, beautiful Indian rug against Ralph Lauren, AKA Lipschitz. And I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna lose it because he's such a freak for this stuff. But all of a sudden he just stopped bidding and I got the blanket. It was so poetic. I walked outside and it was really chilly so I wrapped it around myself. And I got kind of nostalgic and really sad. And I started crying, and my tears hit the blanket, and the smell of the desert rose up into my nostrils. Did you go to that auction? No, of course not. <laughs> no? How did you get all that material? I, I love just, it. I just figured it out. Did you know I was there? I just figured it out. Oh, I think I knew was... you would be there. I love the way you wrote that in. Maybe I talked with Dana Ruscha or someone like that who had Me... been there. Was she there too? A lot of our friends were there. <laughs> we were there. What about you? Did other one-woman shows I with did Sandra? A, uh, her follow-up show, which was Giving Till It Hurts, which was, you know played like the Edinburgh um, Theater Festival and uh, the World Festival Hall in England. Oh, you did. You took it to Europe. Yeah, it really went over well. And then you wrote another one. Um, uh, the play, the the um, what was it called? Um, I, I did a, a HBO special for that, her. Is that uh, what it was? Sandra After Dark. Sandra After Dark. I was like a, an executive producer and, and I directed it. I see. Now, you uh, seem to be like this authority on one woman shows. Do you think you can write a Joan Quinn show for certainly, me? Certainly. <laughs> certainly. At this well, point. When can we get together? <laughs> at this point, <laughs> anything's possible. <laughs> also, John. Um, I think it's it's so fabulous the way you can you do so many things. I know you're a farmer boy. Or That's your father's right. a farmer. That's right, yeah. I, I love that part of it. <laughs> but you're you're designing jewelry and you're wearing uh, the cross, one of the things well, It was part of my show. It was um uh just based on uh, it's a cross based on some antidepressants. Is that it? It's <laughs> cast antidepressants. And and now you're doing it with Terry Tariba. Yeah, Terry's my partner, Boscovich Tariba. Terrific. And, and the one woman show coming up. Yes. Thanks for being with us. Don't go away because we'll be back with Dale Lawner and all of those interesting movies that he's uh, written.
Hi, we're back and we're with Dale Lawner, who in his own words wrote and produced the Fox hit My Cousin Vinny and wrote and produced and directed the Fox flop Love Potion Number 9. He said it. I didn't say it. <laughs> Dale mm -hmm. was born in Cleveland, Ohio and moved to the Valley, the Valley in California in Los Angeles with his parents in 1953. He says that he had a fairly normal childhood. In the third grade, he wrote and acted in plays, was a skateboard champ at 12, and at 14, he won first place in his home-built hot slot racer. This was all in the valley, mind you. He never left till he graduated from Taft High and Cal State University at Northridge. That was a great art school. Did you ever think of being an artist? Cal State Northridge was a great art school? I think Total so. Total news to me now. I oh, have no idea. You were never going to no, be an artist? I thought it was a business school. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. So were you taking business classes? Uh, originally, yeah. Originally I went to escape the draft. Ah, uh, that's how you stayed. didn't know what to take, so. You took business. I took business. But you took religion, too. Yeah, yeah. How'd you get into taking religion? Um, one of the uh, general education requirements, uh, uh, there was just a variety of classes you can take, and one of them was, I think, a comparative religion class. I see. So I took that, and uh, it was fascinating to me. I thought it was real interesting. Did it help you in your writing at that point, or were you writing at that point? Mm, no. No. It didn't really help. I often, I think I changed majors a few times. I, yeah, what other yeah. educational background did you have? <laughs> I think I was a psych major and a poli-sci major, and then eventually ended up in the film department. Oh, you did go do yeah. work in the film department. Mm -hmm. at, at that point, were you get, going to be a filmmaker? Did you want to uh, you know, direct? I, I don't or? know if I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I think I just wanted to make movies. Um, I think I wanted to be a director, and so I tried to figure out what a director does, because no one exactly, no one really teaches you exactly what a director does. What so does a director do? I don't know now. You still you know, doubt, and know. you're directing, and you well, still doubt. I, I, I thought at the time, because I... I picked up these books on uh, uh, about directors, about these auteurs at the mm -hmm. time. This was like early 70s. And so I'm, I thought that directors did everything. I thought they wrote the movie and did all the production oh, design, and had a heavy hand over the, uh, the cinematography. And um, so I studied all that. And then, and then I came to realize that directors really don't do that much. But you they did. They just direct it. But all. you did do all of that because you wrote and produced and directed one of your films, didn't you? Mm hmm. So you. you the flop. Did the flop. <laughs> Is that what yeah. happened? I was going to ask you why, yeah. why it turned out to be a flop. Yeah. Oh, well, that's a, that's a, that's, that's a long story. That's a long story. That's a well, long story. But, but what. I think you had this. Um, Besides all this educational background, you had this reoccurring role as a salesperson at the stereo store. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that was very good. It's coming back to haunt me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what What were you doing? Just having a job? Uh, yeah, just to. Um, I mean, after I quit college, I had to uh, do something to make some money, and actually, I went to a lab to get a job at a lab, a film lab, mm -hmm. thinking because I had uh -huh. a camera at the time. And I figured, well. I, buy the film cheap and I can get all the processing done for uh -huh, free good. and then I'd make movies and uh, somewhere there was like a stereo store down the street and I stopped in. And that's how that happened? And asked for a job and they said and they gave me a job and, and uh, I remember I lied through my teeth through my experience and I even met the owner of the company and he remember, in fact I, I remember him asking me a lot of questions. Uh, about the store I worked at, and I think I had been reading electric Kool Aid acid tests. So I said, um, I said I worked at a store up in Palo Alto, right? And I made up the name, and he picked up the phone right then and there oh, and no. called this fictitious stereo store. You're kidding! Yeah. So and, you were uh, caught. I no, well, I wasn't caught. I just said, geez, there, you know, they couldn't find it in information, so. Uh, he says, what do you think is wrong? I said, well, geez, I have no idea. I think maybe they're going to change the name, but they, I'm sure they wouldn't go out of business. They were really doing well. 
That's why you're such a great storyteller. It just takes someone to write stories who can just make up stories. Who can lie their way into a job. <laughs> on, you're right. On yeah, the spot, right. on the spot. Right. <laughs> what was your first big break? Um, you, you made a low budget movie. That was not a break. That was, yeah, yeah, that was never finished, so it was not much of a break. <laughs> was, would you call Ruthless the, People? Ruthless People was the first break. Would that be like the big yeah. break? Tell us how that all came about. Well, let me see if I can give you the condensed version of it. Yes. Um, I lived in Venice in a fourplex, and there was somebody who lived downstairs who was a reader at MGM. Oh. And we became friendly. He had a friend, an aspiring writer, named uh, Dan Ackerman, and Dan... Um, was interning for these two producers, which is basically reading scripts for these two producers. These two producers, Joanna Lancaster and Richard Wagner, had a mutual friend who was managing Sylvia Christel at the time, the softcore porno actress. And apparently they were looking for a breakthrough project for her, right? This something is that can show. <laughs> well, hold on, this is, this is it. It eventually gets into my career, but... Uh, wow. And then um, uh, they wanted to know if I had anything, and I actually had a story which was very, I would say, similar to Pretty Woman, and, uh, and they were interested in it, and so they wanted to, I pitched them the story, and they were interested, so they said, do you have any writing samples? So I showed them one script I had that was finished, and I showed them Ruthless People, which I was rewriting, and I didn't like the last half, I gave them the first half, and they loved it. So that was how yeah. the big break comes in. I mean, no one ever knows how, how fate is going to deal its cards. No. Because there you were, I mean, in Venice. Yeah. Were you working in a stereo shop at that no, time? No, no. you gone way past that. But you also uh, wrote uh, Blind Date and Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Is that right? Am I right about these things? Yeah. R Blind Date, I wrote um, the original script. Um, it, it was, it was an, a pitch I had, which I pitched to a number of studios and went with one studio. I wrote it. They thought it had too much edge, so I got fired off it, basically. Oh, and then I they see. put somebody on to rewrite it. That rewritten draft was then given to Blake Edwards, and he rewrote that. So if it's a movie you like, you have to give him more of the credit. Or if you I don't see. like it, give him the blame. Well, so. you, we talk about um, liking these movies. Did you like Ruthless People when it was finished? I don't think I've liked anything I've done. Really? I think I've looked at all of them and, um, and, and have been disappointed because I tend to look at all the things that are missing. Uh, well, what, yeah, what happened Rather with, than everything that's there. Did so. you see Bette Midler in that role? Did I see Bette Midler in that role? Um, sure. sure. You did? Absolutely, yeah. I thought she was fine. Danny, actually, I didn't see Danny in the role, although I thought, always thought Danny would be good at it. Uh-huh. Danny DeVito? Yeah. The other thing, did you, you did My Cousin Vinny. I'm talking about short actors now. Yeah. So I'm moving into to your... Short Italian actors. Academy of my War. specialty now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my Are cousin, there any others out there? What do you I think? don't know. You'll probably find them, yeah. right? My Cousin Vinny. And we have a little clip from that. And, and that was an award-winning uh, with, with Marissa Tomei. Mm. So, and... And you didn't like it, or you liked it? Please tell me you liked it. We all loved it. Oh God, no! I thought it was unreleasable. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Actually, that. actually, when I saw Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, uh, the first time I saw it, I actually enjoyed it. Okay, let's yeah. see a clip from this. Okay. I'm positive. How could you be so sure? Because there is no way that these tire marks were made by a 64 Buick Skylark. These marks were made by a 1963 Pontiac Tempest. Objection, Your Honor. Can we clarify to the court whether the witness is stating opinion or fact? This is your opinion? It's a fact. I find it hard to believe that this kind of information could be ascertained simply by looking at a picture. Would you like me to explain? I would love to hear this. So would I. The car that made these two equal length tire marks had pause attraction. Can't make those marks without pause attraction, which was not available on the 64 Buick Skylark. And why not? What is pause attraction? It's a limited slip differential, which distributes power equally to both the right and left tires. The 64 Skylark had a regular differential, which anyone who's been stuck in the mud in Alabama knows. You step on the gas, one tire spins, the other tire does nothing. That's right. 
Is that it? No, there's more. You see, when the left tire mark goes up on the curb and the right tire mark stays flat and even, uh -huh. well, the 64 Skylark had a solid rear axle. So when the left tire would go up on the curb, the right tire would tilt out and ride along its edge. But that didn't happen here. The tire mark stayed flat and even. This car had an independent rear suspension. Now, in the 60s, there were only two other cars made in America that had positive traction and independent rear suspension and enough power to make these marks. One was the Corvette, which could never be confused with the Buick Skylark. The other had the same body length, height, width, weight, wheelbase, and wheel track as the 64 Skylark, and that was the 1963 Pontiac Tempest. And because both... Were you... Were, were you collecting cars? How did you know so much about cars? Uh, misspent youth. Is that uh, yeah. a, and your, your, and your yeah. home-built uh, hot slot racer? Well, that was, that was a slot car, actually. Did that help with little, this? Well, that led to, actually, to full-size cars. Did it, because and, the uh, idea that someone would sit and listen to this woman tell all about cars and, and make it interesting, you know, and to hold your attention on the screen. Did you... <laughs> Was that a question? I that didn't figure that, that one out. Like, how'd you do it? <laughs> um, it was uh, it was it was something that I I had I was just a repository of information of of, of car trivia in that high school. So I mean, if I read it, I I remembered it. So somewhere along the way, while writing the story, I thought um, they should have some kind of sort of street knowledge. Mm. And so I asked myself, what street knowledge do I have? And so I knew that stuff. And it was, uh, so I figured, let me, let me structure the whole case around that scene. So, and and then, so you basically, as a writer, you, whoops, yeah. we sort of head everybody off into the wrong direction and then that, come back to that. That was so great. Do we see Vinny's uh, two, three, four, five, forever? Do we see those in your future? We see Vinny, too. Do we see? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I see a lot of them because yeah. I thought it was so fabulous. And everyone that I know who's, who's seen it says it's great. And, Dale, you're terrific, too. Well, so are you. Thank Thanks you. for being <laughs> with us today. It's over, huh? It's over. Okay. Wasn't that fast? Well, that was quick. <laughs> thanks. Okay. Thanks. And thanks for watching. And don't forget to keep writing your letters to 520 South Grand, 8th Floor, Los Angeles, 971. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. Bye.